Welcome to the commentary. It's me, the guy who made this thing, Nathan Barnett. Uh, sorry, I got a lot to say about this shot, so I'm going to just start rambling through it. This was shot at a thousand frames a second. It cost a ton of money because we got a phantom camera. Um, so this shot in reality took place in under five seconds. Basically, the camera was on the flower. We threw flower petals. I dove into the frame, and as that was all happening, they snapped wide with the lens. They went from tight to wide. And it, we slowed it down to a thousand frames a second, and it ends up being about two minutes. I want to redo this. It did not come out really the way I wanted uh, because of how my body is falling. I don't like my position. When you finally see me, my arm is out because I, I ran, jumped off a trampoline, and dove into the sand, and I instinctually could not. I fought it as hard as I could. I tried to land on my side and my face and my neck. I just... My body wouldn't let it happen. I kept putting my arm out because I would have got pretty hurt. Um, so I realized later, and we had buried a little pad in the sand there, so it wouldn't hurt as bad. I realized later I could have just been laying on like a platform or something above the camera and just rolled off and fallen straight down because I did a test shot or a thousand frames a second with this little camera. And I fell so slowly because I was only just falling down. I wasn't diving from a run. So uh, this is something I would like to redo when I shoot the next parts of the movie. Yes, there'll be parts two and three, but I'll talk about that later. But I want to redo this so I fall better. Um, but yeah, it's me. This What this scene is symbolizing is these flowers right here. This this flower. You'll see it later in the movie. Whenever you see it, it's, it's connected to her. These flowers were around in his past with his ex. He's thinking about his ex when he sees that flower and he's falling and getting hurt because it hurts to think about her and then he wakes up and we're into the first scene uh so this scene here uh i wanted people to not understand what was happening at first i want people to think it's just a couple going on a road trip or something and nope Something else is going on. I also wasn't sure people would think he's, she's being kidnapped until they see that. Uh, hopefully people could read that. It's kind of quick. But it says bail enforcement badge. That's basically, that's the technical term for a bounty hunter. Um, I wrote down like a ton of notes for this voice, for this whole commentary. And I'm not reading any of them. I had so much I wanted to say about every shot and scene. So let's see if I can get through it all. Um, this was kind of difficult, these, the driving, first, the driving scenes, because um, we had three different audio people recording audio during these day, during the whole short. So everyone's settings were a little different, so when editing, things were up and down, up and down, but my friend Brent, who's an audio wizard, uh, he works at Adult Swim, he mixes like all the commercials and things that I've been in, uh, he truly, truly fixed these scenes. It sounded not great before, because it was like three different people's audio and the settings are all different it was a nightmare and the car is loud and the wind it, ugh, gosh my car is like not the perfect car to be filming be filming in uh so that was kind of a hassle but it sounds all right now i'm actually pretty happy with how it came out because i was hearing how bad it was beforehand um this act uh, there was a lot that i cut out of these two scenes to the driving scenes because it was just too long it was like nine minutes by the time they're out of the car on the desert road, like on the side of the desert road. And that's kind of like when I, I feel like the movie starts moving and it starts to feel more comfortable. I actually feel like relief once we break down because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're in the car for so long. People are going to get bored and I don't want people to get bored. But I also wanted people to think, oh, maybe this whole thing takes place within a car. If they haven't seen the trailer or anything, just watching it cold. Um, and it's a short film, you might think, oh, it's just them driving. So I wanted the breakdown to be kind of surprising. So I wanted the scenes to drag on a little, but not too long. And I had a really hard time cutting out sentences and reworking a conversation that didn't make sense. I had to make, a sen make sense. So there's a couple of voiceover lines in here in the scene coming up. This right here, well, check this out. When she does this card trick, I had written in that she reveals a card trick have a card in her hand but I didn't know how I would actually have her do it and Phoebe's dad uh, the girl who plays the alley this woman right here uh, her dad is a magician so in my house I think oh maybe Shirley sure knows how to do this but she didn't and my brother Josh who was doing still photography showed her that he's like oh why don't you just do it like this I was like of course Josh just knows how to do these random magic tricks so Josh uh, actually showed her how to do that and it looked really good 
Um, you know, I wonder if her dad was impressed by that. I should ask her if her dad <laughs> saw this. He probably has not seen it. I want her to show him that clip, see if I, it impresses a real magician. That face right there, every time I'd look at that when I was editing, I was like, oh, I look like Tuna the dog. This is a dog that looks like Mr. Burns. <laughs> Phoebe's so good in this scene right here. She's like really, really got upset. She had to cry a bunch of times in some takes. I ended up not showing that, not editing that in because it wasn't necessary anymore. But yeah, she was like dropping tears all over the place in this car. Uh, so what's happening here is the two, the characters are like finally warming up to each other and feeling like things are kind of getting fun. And she's like playing doing the doom and car trick. And then he ruins it, of course, by talking too much. That was something I wanted to establish in the beginning is that this guy talks too much and kind of like doesn't know when to quit he doesn't really have great social skills because he doesn't hang out with people very much that shot right there i love this shot that shot of phoebe that was the camera was still rolling after a take earlier in the unedited uh, the different alternate version of the scene she cries and a tear drips out of her eye touches the seat and that's what causes the car to break down I took all that out because I didn't think it was necessary. The car just senses the energy. So the car is now broken down and it's because the, the car is listening to us and the car itself is stopping us and it's going to make us get through our problems and uh, fix everything. <laughs> so it's the, that's why I can't figure out what's I mean, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what's going on with the car. He wouldn't know if it was broken or not. Um, but I'm guessing you've already seen the movie, so the car shuts down and then turns on when it's like, okay, it's time to go. Um, so it sensed that she was upset and shut off. But yeah, that one shot of, that I like of her was after Phoebe was actually crying and getting herself to cry for the alternate version. And that was like, we were turning around, the camera was still rolling, and it was such a good shot of her. She literally looked really, truly upset, so I, I dropped it in there. So this is supposed to take place in 1989, so there's no cell phones. That's why he's waiting for someone to drive by. Uh, now this scene was supposed to be at sunset during magic hour, and we're supposed to have like this nice glow to us. It was supposed to be like a happy memory, and the sun would have really helped that. There's a movie called Ain't Them Bodies Saints. It's one of my favorite movies. And the intro scene, the first scene, has like this great light. It's in Texas. They're in a field. It just looks so nice. And like I wanted this to look a lot like that scene. And of course it was overcast the one day we go to do this. Um, we had to do all the slow motion stuff with these flower petals, so I just couldn't do it, redo it. Uh, but I'm going to redo it when I shoot the next part. And you hear her voice, it's supposed to sound like it's coming through a phone, because when I feel like when I hear people's voices through phones, it sounds nostalgic. And I thought that would add to the, you know, the nostalgic feel of him like remembering the good times. And also, if you notice here in the desert, all my clothes are like faded blue. Um, uh, in the flashbacks, I'm Richard Blue, and I match uh, Katie, who's Emma. Emma is the character name. Katie was playing her. Our clothes are both like rich blue because we're a pair and we like match. Um, but now that my life stinks, I'm all dried out. It's like a subconscious thing. I'm. I don't think expect anyone to pick up on that, but maybe they would. They not realize it. Coming up is my favorite shot in the whole movie. Uh, I don't know why. I just, I just love. I love the look of it. I want it to be like the poster, but it's like you know, land, it's a landscape. It's not a portrait. It's coming up ready, any second. Here goes. It's when I look down at her right there. Boom. If I pause it when she's looking out and looking down, something about that frame itself. I'd always land on it when I'm editing, and it just looks so nice. It looks like a classic '70s movie, and I feel like. Movies from the 70s look the most like a movie to me, quote unquote a movie. I don't know if it's because they're all on film and I'm just, I grew up seeing film, but film itself, you know, this looks more cinematic and like less like real life and movies nowadays kind of look more like they move faster, the frame rate's different, they look too clean, it looks like, it just looks like your eyeballs and dirty film looks so good and that shot kind of looks like a 70s movie to me anyways. <laughs> uh, and these jeans I'm wearing here, they actually change. No one's gonna notice, but it's kind of like my die-hard tank top thing. I was I forgot to pick up the jeans that I was gonna wear in the short from the tailor, and I had so much to think about. So Seth actually brought them out when he came out. My brother Seth during this scene. So you'll see my jeans change. They're like darker blue jeans, and then the one the jeans I'm wearing for the rest of the short.
are like coming up in a second. They're lighter blue. They match my shirt better. Um, they're actually my favorite jeans. I think that's them right there. Okay, that's not them right there. That was them when I was sitting on the trunk. We shot coverage of the scene when I was wearing both pair of pants. You'll see them later. That spaz right there, I never loved it. I didn't love any of the spazzes I was doing in this line. Where'd you make that card appear from? I just don't think that people understand what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like I'm saying car. He's still freaking out about how she made that card appear in the middle of thin air. And I didn't want to straight up say that. Anyways. Okay, so I got a lot to say about this scene. Uh, we're both wearing blue. Things were good until right this moment. That door right there does not belong on that wall. It, uh, we, I bought that door from Home Depot and then returned it, and it was all banged up and ruined, but I got it returned. Uh, Juice, my friend Juice, she did art department with, for me in this scene, and she attached that door to the wall. And then if you can see Katie, when she leaves, she steps up and over the threshold because it didn't fit. It wasn't level, it wasn't flush on the floor. And we just hit the bottom. Um, and I wanted five locations in this scene. I didn't want the three. I wanted five different things, but I couldn't afford it because we didn't have enough money and I had to cut stuff out of the script. You see, you can't see the bottom of the door there. That's That guy right there is John, the guy drinking at the table. That's my stunt coordinator, John. And my friend Bob is the bartender. My brother Seth is sitting at the bar. Okay, I'm actually gonna pause because there's a lot to say about this scene and it's very quick. Um, I wanted five c scenes. I wanted five slow motion pulls and slams, but I had to cut it out because we didn't have enough money in the budget. Um, it was I was asking for favors throughout this whole movie and I finally found this one location for super cheap and we only had it for a day so i could only do these three shots and uh it was it, this didn't come out a hundred percent the way i wanted but it's great i'm pretty happy with it but it would have been much different if i i would have been smashing through a lot more stuff i wanted to really it shows like how bad this hurts when someone leaves you and someone breaks up it's like getting kicked in the chest and i wanted him to like slam through a bookshelf but I couldn't. I couldn't have anything I could break. I couldn't afford to get anything that I could break. So I landed on my hamper. <laughs> and then I landed on the table, which is my table. Um, and then I hit the chair. I wanted, But I wanted to show him, like, slamming through, like, uh, a barbecue. It's, like, on. That was one of the scenes was going to be at a park and uh, in a backyard. And, like, he's really just, like, slamming and smashing through stuff to show how badly it hurts when someone leaves you. But I couldn't do it, so this is what I have. Um, but how we did it technically was we wired me up. We had a wire on me for the first one. They just pulled me backwards. And then when I was landing on the hamper, it was a different shot, and I just jumped off of a bench and landed on the hamper. Um, and uh, I edited out the bench. And then on this bedroom shot, um, they wrapped the wire around me, so when they pulled it, I would, like, unwind in the air. And that one was very like discombobulating maybe is the word uh it's just like i was spinning in the air i didn't know where i was so i would do basically just wait until i hit something and then figure out where i was and one time i mentioned this in a second in the commentary but i slammed into the chair and uh everyone thought i got hurt um but i was all right because the back brace that i was wearing or like the harness i should say um was so tight i think it actually protected me um and then the bar shot uh, I was wrapped again, but in a different way. So when they pulled it, I would like spin and, and like unravel in the air. And then for the second half of the bar shot, I just jumped off a bench and slammed onto my back onto the table. And I actually like bounced. You can see me bounce. And then I cut before you see it, but I bounce off the table onto the floor. But it was just too long and it, it didn't work in the edit. Um, but yeah, I wanted to have five shots uh, of him just really getting hurt. And uh, the stunt guys made it look amazing by just wrapping a wire around me. Then I removed the wire in editing. So yeah, there you go. Let's continue now. You can see the flowers on the left right there that he keeps thinking about throughout the movie. Flowers right there on the left. There's a second like Genesis in the bedroom. There's a going ostrich picture in the bedroom. There's some Keith Apicary fan art on the wall. That's my table. I broke that table. I did like a hundred times. That chair hit was difficult. I did one where I slammed into the arm of the chair and did, didn't knock it over and I didn't move. And it looked like maybe I broke my back. Everyone kind of freaked out because I wasn't moving. I was just processing what had happened and then I realized I was okay. That fall right there was an improv that I just did it right then and there so you can see Aaron was like dipping down the DP Aaron like didn't know I was gonna do that and he tried to like follow me I just thought it would be funny to do a little slip
The person driving that truck is my brother Josh. That's his little cameo. He's the one that did still photography on this and showed Phoebe that magic trick. Get ready for a little cameo of my forehead veins. Oh, there they are. It's nice to see those guys always showing up whenever they want. I like her makeshift bed that she's made herself. Um, I actually wrote that in that she's laying with a oil pan for a pillow on a towel and has a sun vi a windshield visor as a blanket. So it's like she found stuff in the trunk to make herself as comfortable as possible because the car seat doesn't lay back all the way. There's a bush right next to the front wheel. You'll see in a minute, it's like basically a dried sticks. It's like a tumbleweed thing. I kept propping it back up. There it is. <laughs> I wanted to uh, make sure the consistency was the same so I had to keep like bringing that thing to life. This scene right here, um, well, I should say, I don't love my acting in the last scene because it's like I don't usually do such dramatic acting. Um, I think it's all right, but it could have been better. I feel pretty good in this scene about my acting because I really get annoyed listening to myself and I like get actually frustrated and I can't really watch this scene because I, I feel truly annoying. So I think <laughs> that's what I want. That's good because that's what I wanted. I want her to act snap, you know? She has to like really yell. Steve Urkel Mobile. That line right there, Steve Urkel Mobile, is what makes this take place in 1989 because Steve Urkel made his first appearance on Family Matters in 1989. That's one of my favorite parts of there. And she says that and posts the thing on her face. It's so funny to me. <laughs> oh my god, I can't listen to myself. It's so annoying. You might notice that we're both wearing Keds. I'm wearing blue Keds. She's wearing red Keds. I wanted something kind of just generic and plain and not like really dated. Phoebe and this character are both pretty calm, so when she screams right there, I mean, like, I feel like the stress of that, like she's truly been pushed to her breaking point. Now. That line was added in when we were rehearsing. I like it, it really wraps up the scene well. And that fall, I added that in. Uh, I don't love the fall, but people have reacted and told me it looks like it hurts my spine, so that's good. And now we have uh, some classic time passing shots. See that sand in the background being blown through? That was me. I was just throwing sand into the wind so it looked like there was something going on in the background. It had some depth to it. Um, we just needed to get something to show the time's passing. And uh, Coming up, you can see a grease spot on the window from my head because uh, we kept like oiling me up and kind of like making me look like, sweaty and shiny. And right to my left, there, there you go. <laughs> you can see the grease from my head <laughs> from the fake sweat. <laughs> Coming up in a minute, uh, the wind starts really picking up when Phoebe does her little monologue, and it wasn't windy during my monologue. That gave me a, a real hard time with editing and cleaning up the audio. That was something Brent fixed as well. Um, it gets really windy when she's talking, so he actually added wind to mine to even it out, and I could surprise he took out so much wind from her scene. It honestly sounded like she was in a tornado before we cleaned it up. I feel like I didn't deliver that line very well. I mumble so much. Unparalleled is what I wanted to say, but I go on parallel. Um, this monologue right here, the only woman I've ever loved. I don't know how I feel about it. It's all right. So what the happened was I, I wanted, we're originally in the script, I'm supposed to cry. And then my tear drops and hit touches the car and the car turns back on. Phoebe's tear shuts it off. Mine turns it on. I cut all that out cause it was just kind of stupid <laughs> and it wasn't like uh, necessary. So the takes I was doing, I was like getting really upset and like watering in my eyes and I uh, was trying to cry and I had to look like a crazy person when I cry. I look like cliche cry face. It just looked like I was overacting. So we had to go back and redo this on one of the pickup shot days. I redid that monologue and I just did it kind of real. I was I was very upset in, even in that take you just saw, but I just wasn't letting myself cry. I've in the past two years learned how to like get myself to cry and I'm pretty happy about it. And of course I couldn't even use my new skill. Now. Uh, a moment ago, I always wonder before she sits up, she lays there for a second, doesn't sit up. I wonder if people, was gonna, if people are going to think she's dead, <laughs> like she died in the sun. Because if I was watching and didn't know anything about it, I might think that because she lays there for so long. And this little monologue she gives about why she stole the money, I, I don't know if this is really how crimes work. <laughs> but I did some research, and it seems like this is a very 
possible things she could have done. And I didn't want to be too in depth and too convoluted and just wanted to kind of keep it vague where it's like, yeah, she did something that wasn't like a violent or a crazy crime and she was doing it for her sister. She was being a good person because her sister got, because I want, I want the audience to dislike her, but she does have to be a criminal. So you, but you want to think, oh, she was doing something good for her sister. She's a good person, but yeah, she broke the law. So that's what I came up with. And hopefully people aren't like, um, what the heck did she do? Is that even possible? If you see right here, you see my face. I look pretty upset right before I smile there. That was because I, we were in a scene where I had just cried. Now, I don't know if people pick up on this. That's like one of my second favorite shots right there. I love it. It looks so nice. Um, in this scene, you know, we're like making out. Things are good. It's like, yeah, no hard feelings kind of thing. Um, and then she reaches over and touches my hand to kind of be like, they are there. And in that moment, the car is like, okay, everything's good. Let's get out of here. And the car turns on and drives away because the car is the neutral party. The car is the one that's like in between us. And my brother says driving while laying down. He's driving off into the other side of the desert. As I'm running right there, I'm going right, right, trying to tell him to turn, turn right. And this shot, that shot right there is one of my other top favorite shots. I love all out running in movies. So I had to get one of me just booking it after the car. Right here, I wanted to show that I actually do drag from the car in a shot, so I wanted to go into it. That was me really dragging, and I stopped once my shoes got ripped through and I could feel it in my toes. That other shot, the wide shot where I go through the frame, I was laying on a plastic skid plate, and my brother Seth's driving right here, and I get in and sit on him. In this shot, I don't, but the exterior shot, I had to sit on his back as he was laying down. This was a very difficult sequence to film. We had to do it over like three days. I had to come back on a pickup day when there was no one around and just get the, all the shots to fill in the pieces. Like, I'm so surprised right there that Phoebe was in focus, that Aaron got her in focus. Like, this is so hectic of me turning around and he's trying to find her. He did, Aaron did a, such a good job on this. And then this, uh, he gets her right there, I'm so happy. This right here, it was so quick that shot, but like I straight up get out of the car, let it drive itself, climb to the back, and then the car just starts driving into the dirt, <laughs> and we cut at that point. But I was truly letting the car drive itself and just climbing all over it. Just gonna pause for a second. If you're watching this and you haven't seen the behind the scenes, there will be a behind the scenes where I'll go uh, deeper into more extensive descriptions of all the stunts and the car driving and everything, uh, the whole short, just so you know there will be more info coming okay unpausing now this is probably the most difficult and dangerous part of the whole movie and I had to come back for a pickup shot data fit do it better uh, I was right there under my feet are cutting boards stunt John as I call him my friend John the stunt guy screwed cutting cutting boards from Ikea to the bottom of my feet so I could slide and once they wore out my shoes would start to grip and I'd have to like dive off into the dirt get out from out of the, in front of the car so I didn't get run over because my feet would start catching and I would not slide and I would go under the car so even in this insane moment of trying to stop a car he's still thinking about his ex and there's the flower so he's you know still focusing on her her and he can't get her out of his head and the flower petals falling no one else can see them except for him that's just sort of symbolizes that time is slowing down and showing what is going on in his head but what i'm saying in there is he's moving past her because he's moving past the flower and that was the moment he finally got over her it was like it's time to move on and he's literally moving past her um and then he gets the motivation to push really hard stops the car and she gets on now here i wanted the audience to not know what i was going to do like, is he going to handcuff her? Nope. It's up to the car now because the car is the one in control and it's taking them. We don't even know where they're going. They're just going to, like, wait it out. But I like to think he's quit his job by throwing the handcuffs away. She's not going to jail. Everything happened the way the car wanted it to. Um, the car is taking them where they should be going. So who knows what's going to happen next. I know what's going to happen next because I already wrote the second chapter. There's two... Three more chapters. I mean, there's three chapters total. Chapter two and chapter three. I already wrote them, so I know what's going to happen. But uh, you don't. Me and the car know. You see that dirt road out there? That's not Los Angeles County. The paved road is L.A. County, and it's a lot more expensive to film in L.A. County for the film permits and the police officers to, like, lock the road down. So it would have been about half the price for me to film out here if I had filmed on that dirt road, but it would have looked horrible and been dusty and just wouldn't have been right. I needed a paved road. Um, so I don't even like thinking about it. I don't like 
knowing that information. I'd like to thank these guys right here, Neon Retro Arcade, Aaron Hansen, Gerard, Completionist. They bought like all my arcade games so I could finish up this movie. I needed like 20,000 extra dollars. So I sold every video game and every wrestling toy and everything I've ever owned. And thanks to those guys, they bought all the big stuff and I was able to complete the movie. These credits, when this would play at film festivals, <laughs> it go on for so long people that start thinking I, I swear people thought it was a joke because you'd hear like clapping and the clapping would fade away and then there'd be like more clapping for the fact that holy crap so many people donated to this thing and then there'd be another lull of like oh my god hurry it up and it would become comedic and I think people might think it's a joke and I did two rows so you could I could get more get half get it done in half the time I didn't want to do four rows because you wouldn't really be able to read everyone's names and I had to do it at a speed that was like not super fast so yeah, uh, it was always funny in theaters when this would go on for so long, and then it would finally end. It would be a big applause. So thank you to everyone who donated. I love you all. You're my best friends. Bye.